Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. We are here in the middle of April 2018 in the Paschal season. And um, first of all, as always, I ask for your financial assistance and support. My website is www.russjournal.org. That's R-U-S, Rus, Journal. Dot org, and you'll see the uh, PayPal button that you can use uh, to really keep this show on the air and to finance my uh, research, which is substantial and very original. And speaking of which, today we are going to deal with a topic I've been working on for some time, um, one that I've been probing the perimeters of for some time, but only now have I put a paper together, um, and of course now this lecture on the subject. The title, uh, at least the working title now, is The Great White Tsar, the 13th Dalai Lama, and China in Late Tsarist Foreign Policy. And by late, I'm referring to roughly the period of time from 1895 to um, World War One. To the very late, that last generation of imperial rule in Russia. This is also essential to understanding the Eurasian idea because it has to do with Russia's shift um, at the death of Tsar Alexander III to the Far East. As you know, I've been talking often about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as the um, main weapon against the New World Order. And this lecture series, broadcast, and my own work centers around the notion that the New World Order, or the creation of a one-world capitalist system, um, is the very nature of the end time, the very nature of, of Lucifer's presence on Earth. And that Russia in particular but the East, more generally, is going to be the hammer making war on the New World Order. And therefore, this is not only a political or economic matter, but it's also a, um, a spiritual one. And there is no greater issue, therefore, right now. And Tsar Nicholas II's policy in the Far East, even today, is mirrored in the alliance with China. The last Russian monarch, Nicholas, um, had a relationship with the 13th Dalai Lama, Dubin Gyatso, who died in 1933. There was an old prophecy, it was very popular in Mongolia, China, and Tibet, that referred to the Russian monarch, or at least it was thought to refer to the Russian monarch, that he is the white czar, the prophesied entity that will defend Tibet against imperialism. In the Far East, this legend was very popular. That this white czar in the writings, the ancient writings of, of Buddhism, at least Tibetan Buddhism, he will come from the far north, northern Chambala, as it's, as it's called, and he will restore order to the east, protecting them from degenerate empires of the West, specifically the, the British Empire. Because at the time, say roughly 1900, the British Empire wanted to fully subjugate Tibet and pump it full of drugs, opiates, like it did to most of China um, just before. Russia was their only hope. And the title of this monarch was Caesar, the Caesar Khan, or the Great Caesar. Spelled transliterated is K-E-S-A-R. So there's no doubt that this is a, an ancient reference to Caesar. So under Tsar Nicholas, the Russian policy in the Far East revolved around creating this alliance with the Dalai Lama against the British. The Dalai Lama himself, the, the 13th, built an independent foreign policy aimed against the British in the early uh, 20th century. The big difference, as I've said many times, between Russian 
empire building and the British empire building, um, one of many is that Russia never sought to subjugate anybody. These were defensive buffers, not colonies to exploit. Russian possessions were always completely self-governing. And certainly in the Far East, where you don't really have a huge Russian infrastructure, anybody in the Far East would essentially be independent. But for a while, uh, by 1890, the UK did capture the vassal state of Sikkim, which is the older word for Tibet. And then they forced the Chinese to sign the Anglo-Chinese Treaty of 1890. And then, um, well, the Sikkim was a part of Tibet, I shouldn't say, it's the entire country. But very soon afterwards, they did open up channels with the government in, in Lhasa, which is the capital. And in somewhat of a panic, the Dalai Lama went to St. Petersburg. The Dalai Lama sought an alliance with Russia because he recognized that so many of the tribes in the, in the east of the Russian Empire had supported them against the Japanese. And um, the Russians sent a very important um, Tibetan Lama, who was a member of the Buryat tribe, uh, Dojiev, Agvan Dojiev. And he was the go-between between Tsar between, uh, Nicholas and Tibet. And in 1901, he arrived in Russia. He was a part of a Buddhist mission. Um, and another one, uh, Gumbajab uh, Tsubyakov, traveled to Tibet as a pilgrim. He's a Russian citizen. And he lived in Lhasa for a few months, and he was received by the Dalai Lama himself. So you had two men early on um, essentially exchanging ambassadors. Now, there was rumor at the time of a secret Russo-Chinese treaty or Sino, uh, Sino-Russian treaty that created a joint protectorate over Tibet. It turns out this was a British lie, and even a British newspaper had published the, the text of this non-existent document attempting to turn Tibet uh, against Russia. Um, the way it turned out, let's say by 1904-1905, the Russo-Japanese War, is not very differently from what you see today. Um, it was the British and Japan versus Russia, China, and Tibet. Now, um, the violence between the UK and Tibet occurred at this very same time when the Russians were um, busy with Japan. Um, at the same time, Britain was very far from home. Um, you're talking about the very far north of their Indian possession. Um, but they still attempted to invade the country. And the Dalai Lama had fled to Outer Mongolia. Uh, and under pressure from the British, the Chinese government, which was unstable at the time at best, um, the British government demanded the Chinese deprive the Dalai Lama of any safe haven anywhere, so that no monastery in Mongolia would have him. Uh, and this is you know, another cause for the leader of Tibet to establish contacts with Russia through uh, Ulaanbaatar, and the Russian consulate in Mongolia. Uh, yet another member, uh, another Russian government official, Peter Kozlov from St. Petersburg, was dispatched to um, facilitate communication. Now, the British wanted to create this Anglo-French Entente that eventually fought World War I, and so since the British drive was to get Germany and Russia to fight one another, those are the two threats to the British Empire that couldn't take them on together, so they needed a way to divide them and have them fighting one another. One of the ways that they did this was for the British to make some concessions to the Tsar in Asia which led to the signing of the Anglo-Russian Agreement in 1907. And the result is, at least, that the British had promised not to try to overthrow the uh, Tibetan government and the pro-Russian Dalai Lama. Now, the Chinese government, again, very unstable, very concerned with losing their influence in Tibet, changed its attitude very quickly towards Lhasa. Um, so the Dalai Lama went to the Chinese monast- monastery of Utai, and then he traveled several times to Peking and received by the emperor. So Russia and China reached an agreement where the Dalai Lama could safely return home by 1908. 
So it was a testament to Russian um, diplomacy. Um, but two years later, the Chinese government was convinced that Tibet was seeking greater autonomy and sent a military ex- uh, expedition against them. Unfortunately, you know, Lhasa, the uh, capital of Tibet, did not field much of an army. Um, they were very poorly prepared. And so the Dalai Lama yet again had to flee. Um, but so, you know, by 1910, the, the British had won temporarily. After that, the Tibetan army was outfitted by London. And the purpose there of this, uh, of this, of this new army was to fight China and if possible, Russia. Uh, anyway, uh, the British invasion lasted for about a year and it ended in the fall of 1904. The forces were from British India. And the point, of course, was to extend their influence from India north. And uh, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, 20 years before, the Britain took um, Burma, uh, parts of the south of, of Tibet, um, which is Sikkim, as I mentioned before. So this would be just north of Bangladesh and just to the east of, of Nepal. Uh, and the Tibetan uh, Ganden uh, Fodrang government, which is close to the Qing dynasty of, of China, was really the only state that was free of the British Empire uh, in the region. As is well known, Lord Curzon was um, the head of the British forces in India. And like all British elites, he was absolutely preoccupied and obsessed with Russia. He even believed that Russia was planning on invading India. Now, this is quite a low probability, but he did push London for an invasion of the north, and it was Lord Curzon claiming that he had knowledge of a Russian invasion of India, um, which led to the uh, expedition to Tibet and the taking of Sikkim in the south. You know, unfortunately, as I said, they were using 19th century weapons, and they weren't even good with that. Now, 1911-1912, you had the Chinese Revolution, and the Chinese monarchy was overthrown. That led to a very powerful national movement in, in Tibet, which, one more time, welcomed the same Dalai Lama home. Once the Qing Dynasty was overthrown in Peking, the Dalai Lama, with Russian protection, declared Tibet's independence. The Chinese, in response, once they got their act together under the new uh, national state, captured the northeastern and eastern parts of Tibet, and the Chinese created the uh, Qinghai and Sukhang provinces, um, which were carved out of this area. The Dalai Lama was in some trouble. Um, he was worried about Chinese incursions, and he was worried about British incursions from two different directions. Russia, as always, was the only hope of this country. Um, the 13th Dalai Lama died in 1933, so even in the early 30s, he launched an invasion of, of China. And he began, in his old age, began to rely more and more on his army. And uh, long after the uh, Soviets took over Russia, he surrounded himself with, with pro-British uh, generals. Um, but it did cause content, discontent with other uh, Buddhist lamas in the area. And then it launched the anti-British party, led by the Panchen Lama. And then uh, 1924, again, post-revolution, the Dalai Lama expelled um, the other one from Tibet. Um, whatever their word for excommunication is. It was strictly a political matter. Some of you know that before he took over, Tsar Nicholas II was placed on a trip, put on a trip around the world. And he was focusing on the Far East. And he was extremely impressed by it. They had this very powerful, um, what we would call a traditionalist metaphysical approach to royal power. And it had this firm metaphysical foundation. And it seemed to the young Tsar, the Tsarevich at the time, much closer to the Russian idea than the bourgeois civilization of the West that he hated. Other than Japan, most of the Far East never saw Russia as an enemy. The Orthodox faith was considered um, something very civilized, something close to their own, which British propaganda throughout Europe had, had called Orthodoxy this savage thing, this barbarous uh, Mongol uh, uh, semi-religion. Um, and many in the Far East, and this threatened the British quite a bit, saw orthodoxy as really a completion 
especially the Buddhists, of their own view. And this fact was well known in, in London, and the bankers needed to uproot it. Named Nikolai Rorich, who died in 1947, um, was one of the main researchers. He was a Russian patriot, a monarchist, and he was the one who, in a systematic way, laid out the a popular idea of the white czar. And he popularized the notion of northern Shambhala as this new reign of justice in truth that Russia had the charge of bringing about in the Far East. Um, and the British had responded, of course, by spreading rumors that um, you know, the Russians were Mongols. I mean, they had been doing this at least since the uh, Crimean War. Um, and um, they tried to spread the rumor in the Far East that uh, uh, the Tsar was an enemy of, of Buddhism. And um, this was a Mongol army in trying to connect um, the Russian army with the, the Mongol occupiers of the area many centuries before. Um, so many of the of the Eastern tribes had seen Orthodoxy in a very positive way. Um, and in his round the world trip, he um, he was with several who were very interested in the Far East. Uh, Prince Udomoski, who was a son of the um, and, and really the son of, of, of uh, D.I. Uh, Mendele, uh, V.D. Mendele. And um, he, uh, they both firmly supported Nicholas II's plan for Asia. And it became the Great Asian Program. Um, and it began to develop as a young man. Um, you could describe, you could describe the Great Asian Program this way. This program was really, in practical terms, it was ensuring the development of Siberia in the Far East, economic cooperation with the great and ancient neighbors of his empire in Asia. Nicholas had his own view of foreign policy in his empire, which was different from his father. Not opposed to it, but certainly different. Um, they were concerned, of course, with asserting their primacy in the Balkans, concerning the Straits, uh, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, to oppose Austria and Turkey, etc. And this isn't anything that Nicholas was against, of course. But the previous two monarchs had the Balkan and and and, um, and the uh, Black and Mediterranean seas as their primary concern. Um, that somehow Russian primacy and power could only be achieved with bloody wars in Europe, which Nicholas was vehemently opposed to. Um, but Nicholas said, "We need peace in the West." So then we can promote our development in the East. And really the only group of people in the way were the bankers in London. Of course, one more reports the, the fabled purpose of, of Russian foreign policy was to be found in the, in the Far East. Um, in 1901, Russia established dip, dip, diplomatic relations with Afghanistan, which provoked uh, a reaction in Great Britain who, in an indirect way, viewed Afghanistan really as its possession. Um, and needless to say, you know, the emperor saw his movement to the east uh, in religious terms. And he had a great respect for Buddhism. Now, as I've said many times, Buddhism is not a religion. Um, there is no God if you don't want one. But it is a very profound philosophy. That certainly doesn't contradict, at least in most senses, uh, the Orthodox faith. As many of you know, Sarah from Rose began to see whether or not Buddhism can be kind of the intellectual foundation of an Orthodox metaphysics rather than, uh, or in, in addition to Platonism. So the great Buddhist federation was something that Nicholas was interested in. And the point was to build this anti-British and anti-bourgeois alliance uh, among Tibet, China, and Mongolia. And really, uh, you know, by 1905-1906, Petersburg became the central hub of Buddhist studies in, in Europe. He was an admirer of Eastern political theory and did not see Buddhism as a religion. But he saw it as a profound philosophical doctrine that has a certain role in Christianity in a limited way. And even today, 
Buddhism is one of the official five official uh, creeds of of the Russian Federation. Um, I mentioned um, one of the Dalai Lama's confidants, uh, Agvan Dorji, visited Russia starting in 1898, and he was very very interested in this um, federation, in this project. And he became, uh, as I've mentioned, one of the go-betweens uh, from East Asia to Petersburg. Another man of great significance here is uh, Peter Badmeyer. He was a Buryat Mongol who had grown up in Siberia. And he um, was an aristocrat and intellectual, and he converted to orthodoxy with Tsar Alexander III as his godfather. He did have influence at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and he was granted a, a senatorial title. He also was the first doctor of Tibetan medicine and an herbalist, and he opened the first institute of oriental medicine in, in Petersburg. Again, something that, you know, this was a, a very traditional kind of medicine, and traditionalist rulers in Europe and elsewhere were very interested in it. Uh, Badminton's agenda was the unification of Russia with Mongolia and Tibet, not as a single political entity, but as an, a firm alliance. And this, of course, is the creation of a Eurasian empire. Like so many interested in the Far East and who had the ear of Tsar Nicholas, the mission of Russia was in the Far East, was a way to unify Islamic and Buddhist peoples against liberal contamination. He wrote an essay uh, in 1893, um, as early as 1893, sending it to Tsar Alexander III, called The Tasks of Russia in the Asiatic East. And he was listened to because his political expertise secured the support of Mongol tribes and groups and nomadic organizations in the Far East during the Russo-Japanese War. Badmayev, like several others, knew of the legend of the White Tsar, that he would come from the north, that he would restore the now decadent traditions of a true royalist Buddhism. He writes to Nicholas II and he says this, Buryat's Mongols, especially the Lamas, were always repeating at that time that the time had come to extend the frontiers of the White Tsar in the East. What they mean by this, of course, is that they meant for the Russian Empire to protect them against Japan and, by extension, the British Empire. But the Russian Tsar was perceived even by Turkish groups um, as the great leader, the great um, liberator. Akpari Shah was the Turkish Islamic view of him. Uh, it just means the White Tsar. And Buddhists actually, actually the Turks um, throughout Central Asia had given this, uh, this um, uh, was given to the Russian rulers even in 1940 as a sign of respect. Of course, it was a way to gain protection of, of Moscow against, um, against their opponents. And, but prior to this, prior to the Soviets, uh, the Khan was seen as a white man. That's not necessarily what white means in terms of white czar, but it did have a racial component. And all contemporaries agreed to this. And it went deeper than that because the Buddhists of the Far East saw Tsar Nicholas as a descendant, so to speak, of Genghis Khan, whether it be by blood or reincarnation. And as some of you know, I've been lecturing for a long time that there was really no Mongol occupation of, of Russia, no Mongol conquest of Russia, um, or at the very least that those who conquered um, parts of Russia were not Mongols, they were not Asiatics. Genghis Khan was depicted by contemporaries as a white man. But regardless of that, all the children of the Khan, so to speak, were granted this title, including the Russian emperor. Uh, the British researcher uh, F.H. Terrell, 1894, says, remarks that, that it, the consciousness, um, and he was, he was impressed by how large the Russian emperor looms in the Oriental consciousness. Their hopes and dreams, he says, as a British national, he says this, are connected to the Tsar in Petersburg. These are high compliments. The idea of the white king was equally close to all the peace, peace, peoples of Eastern, uh, of the Far East that were part of the Russian Empire and even beyond it. The color white, um, apart from its racial connotations, 
in the Far East was universally seen as nobility, aristocracy, and purity. The color black referring to slavery, ignorance, and darkness. Vladmayev and um, Dorjiev, as I mentioned, um, were both close and were both equally close to the Dalai Lama himself. Dorjiev um, began, like, like Badmayev and, and Rorik and many others, they worked together to create this notion. And they, they took it just directly from the legends of the Far East that this new coming kingdom of Shambhala, uh, and it comes from uh, the Kala Chakra text of Tibetan Buddhism. And so this isn't something they invented. This goes back to the Tibetan, uh, very ancient in, in, in the Tibetan mind. And it was uh, Dorjiev opened the first Buddhist temple in all of Europe in Petersburg. And it was that pro-Russian Tibetan uh, wing of it that was established there. And, of course, Nicholas Rorick was uh, one of the artists who um, who worked on the temple itself. And he had been, as I mentioned, introduced to the legend of Shambhala and Eastern theory by uh, Dorjiev himself, who was a lama. Uh, a name you might know, um, uh, George Gurdjieff was another. He had a tremendous impact on esoteric mentality in the West. And he also was friends with Udomovsky, Badmiev, and Dozhev. So you had this tremendous circle of all pro-Russian, all pro-traditionalist, all royalist uh, Russians and who were making contacts with the Dalai Lama um, starting in roughly 1895. Uh, as he was designing this first Buddhist temple, Rorik was introduced to the concept of Shambhala and Russia's role in bringing it about. Uh, you, you could talk to him. You know, he was a traditionalist in the same school of, 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 um, of Gnong and, and of Ola. Between 1925 and 1928, now this is a bit later, Rorik had taken five expeditions through Central Asia. And that little-known region, region between the Urals and the Himalayas, which he called the heart of Eurasia, his concern was ethnographic the traditions and stories of, of the peoples there. And he wrote um, two books, the Altai Himalaya, the heart of Asia, and the other one was Shambhala. The Kalachakra text, that just means the wheel of time. Uh, it is from the Tantric school. It is Tibetan. And it does refer to Shambhala as this hidden country where the ancient texts are followed in their purity. Um, you had some old believers who had their, you know, we know, we know of Ketia, which is the ancient, uh, true Orthodox city that was sunk, um, during the invasions of the Middle Ages. But you also have, um, Bilobodia. Um, also, you know, Ketia is in a lake, Bilobodia is, you know, also concerns water. And they weren't too different from one another. And they were preserved by the old believers who had escaped um, the Nikonian monarchy by going very far out uh, to this part of the world. Um, and priestless uh, old believers said this to um, Rorich in his travels. He said, In distant lands, beyond the Great Lakes, beyond the highest mountain, there is a sacred place where all truth flourishes. There one may find supreme knowledge, and the future salvation of mankind. And this place is called Belavodya, meaning the white waters. Bela for white, Vodya from for water. So northern Shambhala was, in Rourke's mind, and many of the old believers, many others, as Russia, Eurasia. In the heart of Asia, uh, Rourke describes Shambhala as a future kingdom, uh, as well as a historical event where this new era, era of traditionalism to finally overthrow the Kala Yuga will dawn. And of course, Kitsia, as I've mentioned before, simply another variation of this same thing. Same concept, anyway. But like all the rest, Rorik saw Russia's critical role in bringing the philosophy of the East into a unity with uh, orthodoxy to create a new synthesis, philosophically speaking, a traditionalism that would make war on the decadent West. Um, it certainly doesn't seek to overthrow any of the doctrines of orthodoxy, but it sees the Far East as closer to orthodoxy than the philosophical um, point of view of the ancient West. Um, so the, the Caesar, the Caesar, 
in the Tibetan works, the hero king will come from the north. There was one Tibetan lama who said this at the return of Kesar. He says this, It is from Mongolia, which could also mean Russia, by the way. And he will come again with his army to exterminate all those who oppose the reign of justice. We have slept long while he, the Invincible, was resting. But we will awaken for his return. In the conquest of the world, he will lead millions of Asiatics who today are sleeping. He'll be reborn among us. The power of our united thoughts will construct him. He will be the tolku, which is a, a thought uh, object. In the minds of all of us, whom the filings, which are the Europeans, uh, in their case, he's referring to Western Europeans, especially the British, wish to make their slaves. The true faith will be preached, and those who refuse to act justly, the masters who insist on remaining masters, the slaves who persist in remaining slaves, will be exterminated. It was not uncommon to refer to Asiatic Russia as Mongolia. Um, he's not referring necessarily to Mongol peoples, he's referring to um, Russians acting in the East. That was the interpretation of all the major uh, Buddhist thinkers uh, that I've mentioned. But you had many following the Lamanist idea. Um, even during the reign of, of Empress Elizabeth, in the middle of the 18th century, the Emperor of Russia um, had the potential of following the footsteps of Buddha in the in the East. Um, the Bodhisattvas, the notion of someone who has reached nirvana, but doesn't go there because his role is to teach those who are still unenlightened. So in Plato, this would be like someone who gets out of the cave, blinded by the sun for a while, learns what the sun has to teach him, what, what truth is, and then goes back into the cave. You know, he doesn't want to, but he has to go back into the cave because his job now is to teach others. You reach the truth, and it might be nice just to stay in the, in the realm of forms, but um, you can't do that. You have a job to do, and that is to teach others. So the world being uh, in such suffering, as it was then, or far worse now, these people stay and they teach others the way. But it was through Badmayev that this idea reached Petrograd. And at the same time, as I mentioned, uh, Sergeant Nicholas was quite impressed by Chinese medicine. Rorick uh, wrote uh, to a great degree over this. The White Czar is the leader of the coming age of justice. He's reporting on conversations that he had with the nomads um, of, um, of the Far East. Um, um, uh, South Central and, and Eastern Russia. And this is what he, this is what he reports. If one of the family knows how to sing, may chant the ancient ballad of Kesar, the mighty warrior king who conquered Tibet in the past and is expected to reappear in this world to establish the kingdom of righteousness. The usual dull expression of the nomad suddenly lights with an inner flame that conveys the ancient martial spirit that is still glimmering. New episodes are added to the ballads and messianic ideas attached to the figure of Kesar. The Kesar Khan is set to return again to the earth and lead the nomad tribes against a powerful enemy who will arise to establish the kingdom of evil. Padmayev, Rorik, and others weren't the only ones to see that this refers to the monarch of Russia. 18, early 1893, Badmayev had stressed that the White Tsar was venerated in the Buddhist world, and that he claimed that the entire Orient, Far East uh, Asian general, will put its hopes on the Russian Tsar. And he influenced Tsar Nicholas um, a bit later, who was already very uh, possibly predisposed to this concept, to move uh, more aggressively in the East. Um... In the early 20th century, Dama Ulunov, who was a lama of the Don Kalmyks, wrote clearly that the Russian Tsar was the Buddhist Chakavartin, another version of the Kesar, this messianic world conqueror, whose political agenda would be to bring forth this universal salvation on earth, in the Asiatic sense of the term. He also maintained that the Romanov dynasty in Russia descended directly from the northern Shambhala. 
So this is growing in popularity by roughly 1900. And like all the rest of them, Udunov was received in 1903 by Tsar Nicholas. The Tsar writes in his diary right after their meetings, he says, This Ulinov should direct the hopes of the Tibetans towards Russia and their wrath against the British. So he had a, uh, Droji of all these guys, had a decisive influence on Dalai Lama, and it didn't take long for him to realize um, that these texts did point to the Russians. Um, and you know, the Mongols, the Buryat, um, uh, Buddhist, Kalmyk subjects, all were converted to this point of view, and they really didn't need to be converted because so many of them believed it anyway. And those who doubted were enemies of Buddhism. And people like Dorzhiev were presenting the Russian monarch as a champion of the Buddhist cause against British imperialism, who will create the mystic empire of Justin. The Japanese Buddhist monk, traveling in Tibet, wrote this, This czar will subdue the whole world and found a gigantic Buddhist empire, or at least the empire of enlightened peoples in general. But he emphasized that such an idea rose out of the messianic expectations associated with the rise and rule of northern Shambhala. Rurik emphasized that the Shambhala idea represents the basic principle of the coming world age of justice, which is expected by the Lama. His observations in Lama's Central Asia in the 1920s led him to write that, although an accidental Western investigator is inclined to underestimate the political significance of the Shambhala idea, those familiar with the movement, those familiar with Lamas, nevertheless, do recognize the power wielded by the name Shambhala over the Buddhist masses of Central Asia. But even under the Soviet system, the NKVD approached the Tibetans using the same feelings and the same notions that the Tsar had sought before. Now, of course, they lied. They sought to destroy Buddhism as a philosophy, as opposed to Marxism. But the Buddhists reacted here um, under uh, Lenin and Stalin um, by stressing the notion that Buddhism is not a religion. In fact, in the Far East, the League of the Militant Godlets were, were led by some of these people, and they were claiming that no, Buddhism is is not a religion at all, but a philosophy of life that can fit within the Soviet system. Now, that's a stupid idea. It cannot. Um, but it shouldn't surprise you that Dorjiev was eventually purged by Stalin. And he invented this kind of weird theory that somehow this circle of, of scholars was allied with uh, Leon Trotsky. I'm not entirely sure what the evidence for that was, but uh, Stalin eventually put an end to this. But you had some even in the 40s. The Germans invaded, you know, they're saying that the whole world is rushing towards Armageddon. Everyone is confused. Everyone's unsure about the future. But the old Russian tradition, they have found their course and they're streaming towards this great future. They didn't put their faith in the Soviet system. They did put their faith in Russia. Dorzhev, um, during the reign of Nicholas, saw Russia as a defender of Mongols and Tibetans against oppression by Japan and England. So in 1905, the Dalai Lama himself sent this to the Russian government, June 21st. For 20 years, the Indian British government and the person of its dignitaries showed all signs of oppression, all kinds of, of oppression, various tricks, especially in 1904, the English crossing the border, killing people, robbing property, criminally paved their way and arrived with an army in Lhasa. As a consequence, contrary to the old treaty with the Chinese emperor, without waiting for help from him, the high priest was forced to go to Ugra and start negotiations on the basis of previous agreements regarding the contract included between Great Britain and Tibet. The Chinese emperor was twice, twice reported through uh, Aban Dojia, but without achieving any results. Two people were sent back to uh, Peking and waited there for several months and didn't even receive an answer. So in view of all of this, we ask you to disassemble and separate black from white the treaty between Tibet and England and ask your imperial majesty, the champion of prosperity for all living on earth, that religion and Tibetan state forever be inviolable, that no one oppress the existing order in Tibet, that the British government will never encroach again on Tibet, that all great powers enjoy equal rights here. Until now, 
the Tibetan state conducted its affairs independently, and subsequently, no one should interfere in the internal affairs of their state. Wishing to join together in the circle of civilized great nations, we empower the aforementioned, uh, so that on the basis of the above, he could reach all agreements with all states, and thus any assistance rendered in favor of Tibet will be strictly enforced by the Tibetan people. 1905 was the year of the wooden snake, and clearly the Dalai Lama is saying blatantly that the reign of truth and justice will come from Russia. He shows clearly that the British are the enemy, but also shows no faith in the Chinese emperor. And he sees, and the exact title that he uses for Tsar Nicholas is the champion for prosperity of all living on earth. So, under the influence of people like Dorjia, the Dalai Lama, who was at that time again in forced immigration, wanted to even settle in Russia. Uh, the Dalai Lama uh, sent a, a delegation of monks who handed over to the sovereign the authentic garments of the Buddha himself and the sacred mandala. Gifts of the Dalai Lama testifying to the deepest veneration of the Russian Tsar by the leadership of Tibetan Buddhists. So Udomovsky then became the main resident in the Far East and he prepared a powerful advance of Russia to the East spreading Russian influence uh, in uh, Rataya, which is on Lake Baikal, China, uh, Upper Mongolia, and established ties with, again, uh, once it got stable, Tibet and Korea. So Udomovsky wrote letters uh, to the emperor in St. Petersburg, and he reported um, all the important news in the Far Eastern region. Uh, the only ones who were doing that before were the British, which they did, who they didn't trust. And they really you know, mapped out the area. And they conveyed the most important information about really the moods and mentality of the Eastern peoples and political decisions that were taken by um, their leadership. Um, but Udomovsky uh, said the following to Tsar Nicholas. Your Imperial Majesty, in view of the latest developments in the Far East, I dare to cast the only atlas of my kind given to you just for a few days. On page one, it clearly shows the best way of Transbaikalia to Peking, and it shows the benefits of our position between um, Lagosvensk and Stretton. At this time, the Chinese would willingly sell or give up some preferential terms uh, in this part of their territory, which right now is inhabited almost exclusively by criminal gangs. Again, you have a very powerful network now of intellectuals and diplomats functioning in the Far East, navigating this, you know, what most people were ignorant of at the time and even today, not only the ideas involved, but the powers involved. They created an agent network, which was far more than just, you know, agents. But Udomovsky had the, the money to, to create this network to strengthen Russia's influence in the Far East. And as well, you know, in China included. And dominance in Central Asia was something extremely important to Buddhists there and in the Far East as well, with the exception, of course, of Japan. The head of the agency there of Prince Udomovsky was none other than Peter Badmyev. Um, he was baptized Orthodox um, later on, but he never it never uh, vitiated his respect for Buddhism. So these people are constantly sending back information, maintaining friendly relations with local leaders. Um, created the first telegraph communication uh, on this territory, and this is the only way it was the only telegraph um, that that could communicate with the Russian army. And then really you've got objective. Uh, reliable information on the Far East for the first time. Keep in mind, Russian colonialism has nothing in common with the um, or with the British. Um, Russia had no intention; it didn't even have the ability to occupy these states or dismember them the way that the British had done. Um, but the Western European colonial empires, or the Dutch and the British especially. Um, the Dutch were dominated uh, Indonesia, the U.S. was in the Philippines, and the British and French had divided up the rest of the areas, um, the French uh, in, in Indochina. But the economy of China was controlled by foreign capital, and this comes from pressure from, from the British. Uh, China received, by 1898, China received uh, several foreign loans 
They totaled about 54 million pounds sterling. Foreign powers built railways in China and engaged in the mining extraction of, of minerals, given the weakness of the Chinese emperor at the time. But, as we say, in Europe, Russia had reached the limits of its expansion. Um, and so, even if the gold in the Balkans or in the Straits doesn't, doesn't work out, um, Central Asia is pro-Russian. Most of the Far East is pro-Russian. They want to continue the development of Siberia and even move into parts of northern Manchuria. And the international situation, you know, early 20th century was favorable. And these were um, ambitious. China was falling apart. And any country that could could send an efficient contingent to China uh, did it without any hesitation. Now, of course, the British were very unpopular in the area. They fought two opium wars. They were forced to buy drugs from them, and they hired Hong Kong, essentially, as their as their agency for this. Um, the Americans were had forced the duty free trade. The French took Vietnam. You know, by you know between like eighteen forty two and the beginning of World War One, four, uh, fourteen e- unequal treaties were signed. Uh, the unequal treaties were you know unequal in the sense that one side had far more power than than the other. The big problem was Japan, the King Empire in. Um, China, uh, right around the time Nicholas II takes over, had suffered yet another defeat. And Russian diplomacy um, was to have peace in the area, and the Japanese were forced to kind of moderate their territorial claims. Um, Russia received the Lao Tung Peninsula, which was rent free. That's where um, uh, Port Arthur was. Uh, and the point was, of course, to build a Russian railway in the area. But Expansion to Manchuria turned out to be an error um, because the advance into Manchuria and Korea uh, led to a war with Japan. Um, but also China, well, Russia was interested in supporting the legitimate government in Peking rather than taking part in these unequal treaties. But Russia specialists in China were saying the decline of the Chinese empire was just temporary. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, Nicholas II's primary concern was peace in the West so he could move to the East. Um, and the Manchuria strategy was unsuccessful. Uh, even if, if they were to defeat Japan, um, the Yellow Sea you know, wouldn't have helped either Russia uh, or anyone else in the First World War or even the Soviet Union later. Um, Tsar Nicholas sought peace in Europe in part to seek out the warm water ports of the, of the Far East but this is what led to Great Britain and bankers in London needing to build up Japan into a major power. Uh, with London's support, by 1900, 1895 to 1900, Japan launched colonial um, uh, armies into Korea and parts of China. Russia's response was to build up the alliance with Tibet and China against uh, Great Britain. Um, and at the same time, France and Germany did back the anti-British action. And on these grounds, Russia received Port Arthur. Um, but England and the United States, given this, and given the popularity of Russia in the area, did everything they could to provoke a war between Japan and, and Russia. Tokyo was given tremendous financial support. Um, they went to uh, Jacob Schiff and the Schiff clan, and they borrowed $282 million. And Jacob Schiff was ordered the the awarded the Japanese Order of the Sacred Treasure in 1905, and he was awarded the Order of the Rising Sun in 1907. So it was clear for the world to see what Japan was. Japan became a semi-colony of the British. But what they received in return was the ability to build its own warships. Tsar Nicholas did not want a military encounter with Japan. Um, Now, the Japanese losses in the Russo-Japanese War were far greater than that of Russia. Japan was at 100% mobilization, while Russia was maybe a 5% mobilization. But the Western press went nuts trying to convince the world that Russia had been defeated. Um, The revolution of 1905, 1906 came from these uh, false news reports. 
Uh, Port Arthur wasn't even finished. Its defensive weapons hadn't even been in place yet. Um, but just in the Battle of Luoyang, uh, Japan lost 25,000 men. They lost 100,000 uh, total. Japan was exhausted by the time they went to uh, New Hampshire to uh, hammer out their peace treaty. It certainly wasn't any fault of, of the Russians. It just was way too early for them to uh, be able to resist effectively. And they still fought Japan to a standstill and to absolute exhaustion. But in 1904, the Japanese destroyer, without any official declaration of war, um, attacked the cruiser uh, Vargak. Just a single Russian gunboat, and they were hemmed in by six Japanese cruisers uh, in the Korean port of uh, Chamupo. Um, only about 12 Japanese shells hit the Vargak. He decided to return to port and flood the ship. Um, you didn't have many losses on the Russian side, but the Japanese were at 100% full mobilization. Um, the Japanese, um, um, as 1894, just prior to this, Japan began a war with China to establish control over Korea. Um, Japan and China in 1895 signed the uh, Shimaseki Treaty, which forced China to pay a fortune to the Japanese. And at the same time, the British realized that they had created a monster, um, that Japan was growing very large and very powerful, as China uh, less and less so. Um, the alliance between China and Russia was seen as a threat, and there was a debate over what the future of China was, whether or not the decline of the Qing Dynasty was in fact permanent. Um, once the Qing Empire uh, had collapsed, um, the Japanese were, you know, taken with this. But even even at the uh, post-Russo-Japanese War negotiations, um, they had to abandon certain claims. Um, but, you know, in a letter to Queen Victoria in 1899, this is what Nicholas says. As you know, dearest grandmother, I now aspire only to the world as long as possible, demonstrated by recent events in China. I mean, the new agreement on the construction of our railway. All that Russia wants here is to be left alone and develop its current position in the sphere of its interests, determined by its proximity to Siberia. The possession of Port Arthur and the Manchurian Railway for us is vitally important and does not in the least affect the interests of any other European power. This isn't a threat to China's independence either. The very idea of the collapse of this country and the possibility of dividing it between different powers frightens frightens me, and I would consider this to be the greatest possible disaster. There's no question that the Great Asian Program was a tremendous irritation to the Western world. The most important thing to take from this, clearly, is the development of an Eastern theory that we see coming to fruition today. Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the building of the Eurasian Empire, it has its roots under Tsar Nicholas. The truth is that people like Rorich, Rorich didn't invent these notions. The Dalai Lama was pro-Russian on pragmatic grounds, but he didn't have to be pro-Russian at all. He was pro-Russian largely because the legend of, of the White Tsar gave him and his people a very strong level of confidence that not only can the British Empire, who had long shown its teeth in the area, pumping China full of drugs and all this stuff, um, not only can she be fought, not only can independ uh, maintain its independence, not only can um, uh, war be won against uh, Japan and all the imperial powers, you consider you know, Japan as a, uh, an extension of Great Britain, not only can they be fought and defeated, but a new order a traditionalist, metaphysically and ontologically proper, new order be developed in the Far East. That the old order that is based on uh, the British Empire, uh, based on bourgeois ideology, um, industrialization and, and, and drugs and, and control, manipulation of countries, um, the misuse of language, all this stuff, that it seemed fragile. And it was. 
Of course, in 1900, no one had yet to see World War I, which made certain that Russia, Russian plans would be completely destroyed. The British Empire is the agent of evil in world history. At the time, it was the head of the Hydra. Today, it's the United States. It was a force for evil, and the Opium Wars were absolute, total proof of what the British elites, Jewish bankers in London, um, were capable of, and what they, how they viewed the Far East. They, they, they were racist in, in the, in the negative, bad sense of that term. The Russians were not. The Russians saw, uh, traditionalism and, and the potential to develop the philosophical foundation of the Buddhist philosophy and show that, uh, Russia can be its final completion. That Russia can, um, can guarantee the independence of the, you know, they, they, as Nicholas says many times, he had no interest in occupation. He had no interest in colonial, colonization, colonization. All he wanted was to fulfill Russia's destiny in the Far East, open up equal trades, uh, equal trade with China and Tibet. And the idea of the White Czar, which interested him very much, had World War I not occurred, uh, would have come to fruition. What Russia would have been without World War I is unthinkable. The population was exploding. They were creating um, a tremendous um, uh, Eastern Empire, or really a federation, a Buddhist federation there. Um, the Russians were giving away land by the square mile to peasants in Siberia. And so much of Siberia and the central and southern regions are extremely uh, fertile. But the British were very threatened by this, uh, especially when the Russians uh, discovered oil in the Caucasus. So the British Empire, caring only about the destruction of tradition and its replacement by industry and individualism, um, uh, they needed their two competitors to fight one another, and that is Germany and Russia. Once oil was found, that was it. The British had law. They, that was the last straw. They couldn't allow Russia to continue to develop. World War I was the creation of the British Empire. And it was a way that actually diabolically uh, genius way to get Germany and Russia to fight one another. The Far East was one pivot, but it wasn't strong enough. The Germans didn't have any particular interest in the Far East. They weren't a colonizing power anyway. They found it, of course, in the Balkans, using Austria as their proxy. And the Serbian government had given in to the demands of Vienna, even at the expense of their uh, own independence. The Serbs had absolutely no way to fight another war. They had fought several Balkan wars. They were exhausted. They didn't have the men. And so they were willing to give in to the Austrians. The Austrians invaded anyway. And were defeated, by the way. Twice. Only a massive invasion using the Germans finally occupied Serbia. And this is why Russia ordered a limited mobilization. But they realized if they didn't act, all the Slavs in that area would be taken over by, um, by Germany and Austria. Uh, and if the Germans and the Russians fought and the Russians lost, which did not occur, um, and the British would very quickly change sides and send Austria at odds with uh, Germany. Of course, it didn't work out that way, but that was the plan. And one of the things that was really driving the British crazy was this notion of the Buddhist Federation in the Far East. They would have dominated the area, and Russia would have been populating the area um, because the population was absolutely exploding in European Russia. And with a basically equalitarian system, with uh, all the land being owned by uh, the peasants, there were no landlords in Siberia. They'd never, there was too much land for that. Um, they would have revolutionized the world. And that's what this no Northern Shambhala idea was. So that's what the British created. The destruction of this, the destruction of this idea, and plunging the world into war, World War I, and slaughtering millions of the best of Europe's men, and destroying the traditional governments of the area. 
Um, the British Empire then was an agent of Lucifer, as the American Empire is today. Anyway, I've come to my the end of, of uh, the hour. I thank you all for listening, both my friends and my opponents, if you're my opponent. And finally, you're getting the truth for once in your life. Thank you. Thank you for supporting this show. I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.